to the campus. I do want to welcome you back this year. You've really been back on campus for a week. But, you know, I guess the feeling I get this time of the year is a feeling I picked up a long time ago. I can remember when I was back in grade school how excited I was when school started. And when school starts now, even though that's been a couple of years ago, I still remember that feeling of excitement about school starting. And that's the feeling that I had as I came in here this morning. Now, there may be times when I wonder why I ever thought that way, but it's nice that I, I still have that much left over from when I was a, a kid starting school. Well, it is my, my pleasure to be here this morning and speak to you, give you a chance to speak to me, ask some questions you may have. Uh, before we get started, I was asked uh, by, uh, I'm not good on names, is it Charlie Price? Chuck, Chuck Price? Jack. Jack, okay, Jack Price over at the LDS Institute right over here, if we could pass out some lists, they want, they are having a luncheon for some of the people that they work most directly with here at the college, and uh, Max is passing out several of these. You can read the information across the top as to what it is, and they'd like a count of those who would be interested in having this luncheon with them. So if you just look at that and read it while you're sitting here listening to me or talking to me, and then we can pick those up and get them back over to them so they'll know it. As a new president, at least a new president here, let me talk to you just a little bit, tell you a few things that, that come to my mind, and then I would like to just open this up and see how well I can field some questions uh, or comments that you have as we uh, kick off this year. As you know, or I assume you know, my background, except for the past three years, is really two-year college. Is that loud enough? to your college and especially vocational and technical education. And so I really feel that in coming here as president of the Tech College, I'm coming home because this is the kind of thing that I've done all of my, just about all of my professional career. I started in the public schools as a vocational teacher. And so I've enjoyed the last six or seven weeks very much and look forward to the, the coming year and years with a great deal of anticipation. I don't know the college like you do, but I have some perceptions that I'd like to share with you and see if you agree, and then maybe we can talk about what we can do to change those that are somewhat negative in relation to the college. I'm firmly convinced that this technical college is the most, under, most misunderstood institution of higher education in the state. Now that may be shared with the one at Provo. But we are misunderstood. All the way from the comments of a fellow when I was considering being an applicant for the, the job of president, who said that he thinks the general feeling out here in the valley, out here in Salt Lake County especially, is that this is just a high school shop class with ashtrays. <laughs> Meaning we have little older students, I guess. Well, that's a misconception. You know, in, we may, and this is just my feeling, we may kind of compound or add to that ourselves because there are a lot of us who very affectionately call this place trade tech. And that's what it was up until 15 or 16 years ago. But it is now a college, and there are a lot of people who, here in the valley who really don't realize that it is a college. 
they really don't realize that it is more than an extension of some high school shop class. Well, that's a misperception that I think we have to work at because it's a misperception that keeps a lot of students from coming out here and finding out what a tremendous place it is and what a wide variety of post-high school classes we have. I lived in the Northwest for some 15 years, but in the process of working with two-year colleges up there, I become acquainted across the country from California to New York to Florida and many places in between. And I find it interesting that the reputation of this college seemed to be greater outside of Utah than it is here in Utah. This school has a good reputation in the state of Washington, in the state of California, and many places in the Midwest and the East Coast because of the quality of the students that have come from here and because of the feelings they have for the school due to having had a good experience. But when I came to Utah five years ago, I didn't run into that kind of an attitude near as much as I expected. And so it's here in, in Utah and really here in the Salt Lake Valley, I think, that that, that problem exists. Now, what we do about it, of course, is, is something that's debatable. But I think the thing we do have to do is be consistent. If we're saying different ones of us are describing it in different ways, even if what we say is good and positive, if we're not consistent, then I think that creates a problem. Now, there are those who say we are not a community college and we never will be a community college with a very negative connotation on the word community college. I think that's unfortunate because I think the word has been taken and misconstrued and it, those who misconstrue it in a negative way view it differently than I do. To me, for instance, a community college is just a college that is in a community and belongs to the community and provides those kinds of post-high school education for the community that are not provided by any other institution, like a university. Those kinds that the community wants. And when I refer to the community, I'm not just talking about the students who vote with their feet. They come here if we have what they want. But I'm talking also of the people in business and industry who want to hire our graduates and want them to have the skills necessary to do their jobs. Well, if we meet those needs, if we're not meeting those needs, then we're really not doing what we want to. Now, there is one other little dimension of this. There are those who say that if we add general education courses, we're going to soon become a liberal arts college. Uh, if I thought that were true, I'd say we won't add any more general education courses. But I have 20 years of experience that says that times are changing and even those people taking the very basic welding, machine shop, automotive kinds of courses need more general education courses than was thought that they needed even 10 or 15 years ago. Well, we'd better have the general education courses that will help our students when they go out into a shop somewhere to meet all the needs of that. And if we graduate someone in automotive and they can't up write up a job in their shop, then they probably won't stay there very long. So they at least need to know how to write that much. And as you know, we, we will get some students who don't have that much writing ability. They need to do some reading, and some of the students that will come to us and have come to you have difficulties with reading. And the other communication skills. You've got to be able to speak so that you can speak to a customer, no matter what area you're in, if you're working with customers. So we have to provide that kind of general education. Now, you need to know that I am a vocational educator. Vocational education is my life. 
And I agree very fully with the fact that this is a technical college, that it is here primarily to meet the vocational and technical needs of the Salt Lake Valley. I don't think we should ever get away from that. But I think we're hurting ourselves if we feel that to even add general education classes related directly to that is a threat and that someday our good, well-known vocational and technical programs will suffer because of that. Now that. I understand that there are some of you who have concerns with that and I hope maybe we can talk about that a little bit because that is my philosophy. I think this school has to expand a great deal in order to meet the needs of the valley. So I guess what I'm saying is we're a community college whether we like it or not. We are somewhat of a specialized community college. We certainly are not comprehensive like those, most of those 108 in California, like many of the ones with which I was acquainted in the state of Washington, like the ones I know about in Texas and Florida and Missouri and Iowa and New York. We're not comprehensive and I don't see that we may ever necessarily become comprehensive because to me the word comprehensive means that we are meeting all of the educational needs. Can you still hear me? That we're meeting all of the educational needs of the area. Well, we don't have that kind of a charge from the legislature. We don't have that kind of a charge from the Board of Regents. And until we have that kind of a charge, we should see how good of a job we can do with that part of community education, community college education that we've been charged to provide. But that's a controversial subject. And if you've been reading the paper and following it very closely, that's a big issue right now with those in the state who say that we need a third board just to handle vocational education in the two-year colleges, a board separate from the board that deals with the two universities and two state colleges business, and a, a board separate from the board that handles all of public school education. And then there are those who say, no, we better stay like we are and just improve the existing situation. And then, of course, there are those who say that all of education in Utah should be under one board, and that should be the State Board of Education. Some of them do say that the State Board of Education should change from what it is now if it's going to be the only board in the state handling education, but that's a big controversy. Uh, the regents discuss it every time they get together. I'm sure the state board does, and there is a special committee of the governor looking specifically at governance. And the decision they make will very directly affect us. Well, sometimes it feels like it's a little difficult for us to be out here when we're only interested in providing a good education in vocational and technical areas to the students in the valley that we then have to concern ourselves and put effort into the matter of how we're going to be governed, how we're going to receive the money to provide that education and all of the political aspects of the situation. But you know as well as I do that things have changed in higher education in the last few years and we're about as political as we can get. We have to influence individual legislators and the entire legislature in our behalf if we even want to get the money that we're now getting, let alone the increased funds necessary to meet the demands of the increase in students that we're facing. And I understand that if enrollment holds up like it is right now, we're going to have lots more students than we had last fall. So it is political. And so we have to become politically astute if we're not already politically astute. We have to remember who our legislators are, where we live, the one we voted for, the one that represents us in the legislature. We have to remember those old friends from school or somewhere else that are also legislators. Then we have to figure out what's the best way of approaching them to tell them our story 
and see if we can get a commitment from them that they are supportive of this college. Now, I see my role as president as a dual role. One is I'm charged by the regents who hired me to be a manager for this school. The second one is I'm charged by my responsibility to the school to get out there into the community and work with those legislators and other community leaders that will influence the decision in the future as to where higher education dollars go. Dave Gardner up at the university is a good friend of mine. I've known him for five years now and we've worked very closely together. He and I don't exactly agree philosophically about the place of this college in higher education. And he is concerned, I can tell from the comments that I read about in the paper and the comments I hear in Regents meetings. He is concerned because he sees the, the press of interest in vocational and technical education and he thinks that that is going to take dollars away from the university. And there are those who are strong supporters of vocational education here in the state, good people, who persist in saying, we're going to take those dollars away from the U and therefore are creating a direct confrontation within higher education. I maintain that we're not out to take dollars away from the university. They're not university dollars until they're, they're, until they're appropriated to the by the legislature. I'm saying that if we do our job and tell our story correctly, the dollars that we need never will become university dollars that we then will abrasively argue to take away from them. I maintain that the legislature will give them to us before they're earmarked and they will be then vocational dollars for this college. And the reason I say it that way is that I think we will hurt ourselves if we persist in fighting among ourselves within higher education. Because then, when we need a united front of all of the nine institutions in the state, before the legislature, we don't have it. Because we've been arguing among ourselves so much that we we're not willing to work together. Now, I agree that all of those dollars come out of the same big bag somewhere. And every dollar that we take is a dollar that will not eventually then go to the university. But we don't have to be abrasive. We don't have to confront them to do it. And so my approach will not be, as some recognized vocational educa education leaders, to stand up and say what we need to do is to take those dollars away from the university. My approach will be to tell the legislators to look at where the students are going. Look at what kind of programs those students are asking for. Look at what schools are teaching those programs and then put those dollars where they should be. And I think we can sell that a whole lot better than being argumentative within higher education. You know, we don't have a lot of clout. In fact, in my opinion, vocational education in Utah has less of a voice than any state that I've worked in. If that's really true, that's our fault. That's because we haven't gotten together behind some vocational organization in the state and supported it enough so that when its leaders speak, people know that they are in fact speaking for us, for all of us. Now, I'm far enough away from the UVA so that I don't know what our relationship at this college is with the UVA. I have some ideas. I don't know for sure that the UVA is the official spokesman for vocational education in Utah. I don't know if the UVA is too much oriented towards the secondary schools and not enough oriented to post-secondary or college level vocational education. But I need to find that out and if you don't know it, you need to find it out too because if the UVA is not our spokesman, we need to find another one that can say, I speak for all of vocational education in the state when they're talking to legislators, when they appear before the Board of Regents, when they talk to other leaders in the state. I think that, that we need to do that. 
Now that's, that's another. That's another one of those things that is outside of the job that we really thought we were hired to do here, and that's either to teach students in a classroom or counsel them in a counseling office or provide the, the backup services to instruction that we do. Well, now that I've said all of that, let me, let me say this. In my opinion, based on a number of years of acquaintanceship with this college prior to coming to Utah, and then based on my acquaintanceship from close hand for five years before coming here, living right here in the state, this is a great institution. I've met a lot of you, some of you several years ago, and I agree with the things that I have heard outside of the state and in the state. And that is that this is a fine group. This is a tremendous group to work with. That you instructors are excellent instructors just pretty much down the line. That the rest of you have a commitment to meeting the needs of students in your respective ways in such a way that students like the college. Now the other night I was on a KSL, what's it called, public pulse I guess for an hour. And one of the best things that happened in the whole hour was a student who got on there and said, I just transferred from the university down to that tech college. And he said, it's too bad that other people can't know what a tremendous school it is, what a great job they do for students, so that they'll know that that's a place they can go for a good education. Well, that goes back to the matter of maybe we don't pat ourselves on the back enough. And maybe that's my job. Well, we are here. It's a good school. It's a, a new year. We're going to have more students than we can handle. We already have waiting lists. And in some areas, we have student-faculty ratios way above what they should be. But I look forward to it. The challenge of it is tremendous. But are you aware of the fact that Salt Lake City is the largest city in the nation without an organized way of meeting the needs, the, the college-level educational needs of students outside of the university. Now, you can call that a community, uh, community college system. You can call that a technical college system. Whatever you want to call it, it is a fact that this is, Salt Lake City is the largest city in the nation that has not formally organized itself to meet those post-high school educational needs. I hope to be a part of the process of getting that organization in place. And I'll let me assure you, those of you who have concerns about what I prefer to call general education classes rather than liberal arts, that as long as I'm president here, this college will never get away from the emphasis on vocational and technical education. but. As long as I am president here, I will work to broaden the base of programs to meet some needs that we're not now needing, meeting, so I've been told, and I will work to broaden the base of general education classes necessary for the students in the vocational and technical programs to uh, more appropriately or more successfully fit into the jobs that they'll be going into when they leave here. Now, it would take me five or six hours to really get into talking philosophy. I think, hopefully, I've set the stage, at least briefly, for you to, to have an idea of where I'm coming from and where I think I'm going. At this point, I guess I'd like to just open this up and let you ask your questions or make your comments and see how well I can maybe field some of them. So, it's your meeting. Okay, the comment was, and I didn't realize that was coming on this morning, but I, 
I had an interview with Jackie Noakes, and it was on TV this morning, apparently. And kind of at the conclusion of that, I said that I foresee the possibility that this school could have 20,000 students by the end of the decade. And the question then was, how can we handle that sort of thing if it happens? Well, the only way we can handle it is to convince people that we need enough new buildings to house those students, and we need enough money to, to hire the faculty and related staff to teach those students. But right now, the biggest limitation on growth at this college is lack of enough money and enough space to teach the students who already want to come here. And so when I was saying that we could be up to 20,000 students, I was saying that if we get the kind of financial support that would allow us to do it. But there are ways of doing it besides just building new buildings on this campus. You know, across the nation, one of the ways of handling uh, tremendous growth, especially unexpected growth, is to go out and what's commonly, uh, what is commonly called is opening storefronts. In other words, getting off campus and finding places that are available that where classes can be taught. Places that are closed down, businesses that are not now open that have the kind of space that can be designed or can be modified to fit the needs for different classes. The greatest limitation there is that many of our classes require expensive equipment and specialized classrooms. But for all of the kinds of programs that don't require that, we can, we can go out into the community. One of the greatest examples of that, in Gresham, Oregon, Mount Hood Community College, that's about 19 miles east of Portland, their campus couldn't handle the growth. They were up to around 12 or 15,000 students on their, regular, on, their, on their campus. And that's a new college. It got started about 1966, 67, something like that. And so they, and they're funded locally. They have a, a local tax base, which has its advantages, but also has its disadvantages, because the public then votes on their budget every year. But they couldn't find a space, and finally one of their advisory members on their vocational advisory council said, hey, there's an old grocery store down in this supermarket, or down in the shopping center two or three miles away that's closed. They've moved out and moved somewhere else, and it's empty, and they're looking for someone to rent the space. So they went down there and rented it. It probably had 30,000 square feet in it, and it was just big old open shell, like a, a typical supermarket. Well, this is now six or seven years down the road from when they first did that, and that's now their second campus. It's in a shopping area. The people come there and go to class and then go do their shopping, or they do their shopping and then come to class. It's convenient. Many of the classes are taught at night, and the, the shopping center isn't open for business at night, and so there's lots of parking for night students. And they have something like four or 5,000 students there now, and they wouldn't move away, and that's daytime students as well. They wouldn't move away from it on a bit. That's the best example of a storefront I can think of. But in my previous experience at Highline College, just south of Seattle, our entire, the state of Washington is divided up into districts, community college districts, by law. And the district for Highline College was about, oh, 40 miles long and not 15 miles wide at the widest place. It wasn't a very big size geographically. But we had 10,000 students on campus and we had 260,000 people living in that little area. We taught classes in 26 locations off campus, 26 different locations, even though no person in the district, of course, uh, students could come from outside the district. There was no limitation on that, but we still had 26 locations, even though everyone in the district could get to the main campus in no more than 20 or 25 minutes, except at rush hour. So that's something we have to look at. Now, there's a problem with that, in that right now, the state says we don't pay any money for classes taught off campus. And that goes back to the hold that the land-grant college has had on extension programs in this state for over 100 years. 
But I think that can be changed. I think it can be changed and we just have to talk to legislators and convince them that that's the way to go and then we can we can teach these students. We can find a place downtown or on out south if that's where the students are coming from and it's easier for a faculty member to drive out there and teach a class. Evenings in the shops at the high schools, we used the shops of all four high schools within our college district up there, used them two and three and sometimes four nights a week for our programs. We had an excellent working relationship with the high schools. So that's some of the ways that we could get to 20,000 students by 1990. Other questions? The relative importance of the night school program versus the day program, in my opinion, is the numbers of students and the pressures of students for the particular programs. Uh, if we get more pressure for night school programs than we do day programs, then that'll move up way high on my priority list. Uh, if we are, in fact, going to meet the needs of the people wanting our kind of education here in the Salt Lake Valley, we are going to have to be flexible, flexible enough to fit our, our scheduling of classes into the kind of a schedule they can meet. Now there will always be enough students coming in the daytime, I think, to keep our daytime programs filled. But quite frankly, I think that if we really advertise the availability of night classes, we would double and triple and quadruple the number of students wanting to get into those programs. Uh, but, but priority for me is based on the priority put by the students as much as anything else. If they say we can't be out there for classes at 10 in the morning or 2 in the afternoon and they want the class, then I think we should be flexible enough to try and find a time that will fit their schedule and teach the class. I think that, that in the future, the success of this college and most others will be, on, will be based very much on how flexible we are and how much more flexible we are than the other institutions offering similar kind of education. I don't know. I'm looking at that. <laughs> I've discussed it a great deal with Max. Uh, we've, uh, I've suggested some, what I consider at this point, uh, fairly modest changes in what, was, what existed when I first came, but I think the solution to that is to look at what we're doing now and list the, the positive and negative the pluses and the minuses of the way it's now being handled, look at the department system as it was before, and then look at a lot of other ways that we can maybe organize ourselves. You need to know that I'm very, very strong on a good organization. I think the greatest flexibility and the greatest freedom to function is based on the most clearly identified organization. But I don't want to jump into any organization very quickly and say that's what it's going to be. Nor do I want to get us to the point where once we get the organization in place, we set it in concrete and say it's going to be like that forever. I think that the organization should be something that will change as changing pressures and demands suggest that it does. So, and I'd, I'm not inclined to move quickly. I would say by the time this year is finished, I should have a pretty good idea of how it is and some good ideas of how maybe it could be changed to improve it. But I won't make that decision. I will finally, but before I make it, I anticipate a whole lot of input from vice presidents, from deans, and from everyone else, including any faculty member on the campus. And then I would want to weigh all of those and sort out the things that seem to work the best, and that's the organization. 
But the day after that organization is in place, I think it should be open to potential modifications as, as changing pressures face it. So I guess my answer is to, to you right now, I don't know. Other questions? How about comments? That's right. We're, I think that deserves it. <laughs> now I hope he gets that tour very quickly this fall. Because that's it. We're invisible. Let me give you an example. Since I've been here, thanks to Lee Brockbank, I've spoken to a number of civic groups. One of those was an exchange club right over here in this D's restaurant one morning back shortly after I came. And one of the fellows in there said, you know, I drive past that college, Trade Tech, every morning, going down Redwood Road. And yet he said, when I hear someone say Trade Tech, I think of that place downtown with the big smokestack. Well, that is, <laughs> that must have been Pat. <laughs> <laughs> That is a part of the college, and it's a vital part of the college, but that's not all of the college. And so I can understand after having heard that where a person says, where have you got enough room for any more students? Because I had just said, well, we have about 7,000 students. And then he says, well, where have you got any room for any more? Then he came up afterwards and said, I was thinking of the old laundry. Well, I didn't know it was an old laundry until then. So we have to work on that. Now I have some ideas about that. I don't know if uh, Paul Gunderson is here or out doing one of the long list of things that just I have asked him to do, plus all the others that others ask him to, but one of the things I'm interested in is seeing if we can get one of these electronically con controlled reader boards stuck out here so that we can start advertising day and night and start reminding people as they drive along there that that's not just that narrow place in the road where you, have, where you get plugged up in the traffic. But maybe while they slow down for the traffic, they can glance up there and read our reader board. But uh, I have been told, I did a little survey on the value of that kind of reader boards uh, a couple or three years ago, and I've been told that a reader board of that nation, nature can have about as much impact as any other one thing we can do if we happen to live on a very busy street. And that we do. So that's one of the things. But we've got to make people realize that this campus here is the main campus of the technical college. Now, I've kind of backed off from it, but when I first came and people kept referring to it as trade tech, I'd keep saying that's the technical college. Well. I don't want people to feel that I'm being antagonistic or abrasive because when they do say trade tech, they do it almost always very affectionately because many of them, their memories go back to when it was trade tech and they had a good experience as a trade tech student. So maybe we need to not work on changing the, the name from trade tech to the technical college, although I'd like to do that but somehow do something to, so that in their mind when they say trade tech, they are thinking of a college, this college. But I think we have to work on that. And you know, one of the things I know for sure is that the president can't do those things all by himself. And so I'm going to rely very much on you, not only for suggestions to me, but when you meet a legislator at a wedding or anywhere else that you pick up on it, you make yourself acquainted if you're not already acquainted and that each one of us began to do our selling job and not just for legislators. 
You know, sometimes when we deal directly with a legislator, we're not as successful because after all, we are a part of this and therefore we're suspect. We're, you know, we're grinding our own axe when we go and say, hey, we need more money because after all, some of that money is going to be our salary. And that's true. So if that's the case, if there are those who feel that way, then what we need to do is find out what friends we have who have influence over legislators. And then make our friend who is not a member of the staff or the faculty here acquainted with our needs in such a way that they feel strongly compelled to tell their friend, the legislator, so that that legislator will, will vote for us for the things we need and will support us when we get into that uh, slicing up of the baloney or cutting up of the pie or whatever you want to call it up there on the hill when the legislature's in session. Well, you know, that's an interesting thing because in the first place, we have been told very directly and very specifically that we will not use appropriated monies to recruit or advertise. So they don't do that. Their money comes to them from private sources. Now, we have a foundation in place, and we've asked for a director of that to help us so that we can begin to get some of the kind of money that doesn't have state appropriation strings to it, attached to it, that we can use to do that. But now, because there are more students than the regents anticipated, like we've grown 5,000 students in the last couple of years in the system, they're now saying that they don't want us to use any monies to advertise or recruit. That puts a little bit different picture on it, but then we say, I say, how come the university then does what they do? And they say, well, that's a specialized athletic thing, or that's a specialized something else. And so finally we get down to the point that some things have been done at the university for so many years that people, especially legislators who have a degree from the U, really don't even realize when we say that preferential treatment is being given to the university in some of those areas. But, for instance, with the athletic program, you know how f some people feel about athletics, about sports, including a lot of us probably. I mentioned the, the programs that the U runs regularly concerning their athletic programs, and then they keep plugging in other things to encourage you to come up to the U. And you can imagine how I got my head chewed off by a, a follower of the running Utes. So it's something we have to work on, but the first thing we have to do is to get non-appropriated funds that we can, can use to assist us. I think that that's the first major thing. Uh, and we have some funds, but compared to the dollars they put into it, we don't. And I think we can be successful in getting those non-state appropriated funds because there is a small school in the state that started seeking private funding, oh, maybe five years ago, and this last year it appears that they may have gotten a million dollars. So, you know, if, that's, if we can do that, we need to go to work on it. That's a good point. Both the newspapers and the television and the radio have what they call public service space that they are required to provide for public service free and certainly advertising education as long as it's not directly recruiting is a public service. And we have taken some advantage of that. I think we can expand that a great deal and that's the kind of thing that they can't that the the regions for instance can't argue with us about because we can say that's the newspaper. 
even if we invited them out here, they still made the decision to run because they, we didn't pay them for it. But we can capitalize on that, I think, a great deal. Now, did I see another hand right here? Oh, Bill. My wrist is still red from being slapped for those SUSC advertisements you saw on the television. <laughs> that was with non-state appropriated money. No state money went into any of those. And in fact, it was when those began appearing on TV that the regents then decided that it wasn't just that we couldn't use appropriated money, we just couldn't use college funds to do it. So you try it, and if, it, if someone argues with you, then you quit. Well, that's one of the big debates. How much of a responsibility does the state have for students out of the public schools, beyond the public schools, to provide them an education? And that's never been settled here or in any of the other states in the nation. Some of them support education much more extensively. For instance, in, in the state of California, uh, residents don't pay any tuition. Their fees are getting pretty high in some schools, but they don't pay any tuition. And that's been looked at here and rejected because of the money situation. But that's the heart of the controversy. How much of a responsibility does the state have? And that probably never will be settled. I personally feel that even aside from responsibility, we can show Residents don't pay any tuition. Their fees are getting pretty high in some schools, but they don't pay any tuition. And that's been looked at here and rejected because of the money situation. But that's the heart of the controversy. How much of a responsibility does the state have? And that probably never will be settled. I personally feel that even aside from responsibility, we can show that a vocational technical kind, a skilled, hands-on kind of, of job training, like we do, will pay back to the state in a very short time just in the added taxes that it brings in to them. And we can even make an economic case for the importance of, of this kind of post-high school education. But when you get to, to talking about how much of a responsibility they have, that's kind of like talking about uh, apple pie, motherhood, and the flag, and that sort of thing. Maybe a student then who has been rejected to a school because they won't support it like they should, take it to court and get a legal if, if you've got one in mind, see me afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you. Well, I think it relates to it, but the matter of getting organized is first a commitment on the part of the city or the state that we meet the educational needs of these students. For instance, I don't have statistics to support this, but since I've been here I've heard from several sources that there are probably as many as 25,000 potential students right here in the Salt Lake Valley between the ages of just 18 and 22 or 23 who want some college education and are not getting it. They either can't go up to the U or the U doesn't have the kind of education they're interested in 
and we have waiting lists for them here. If the state recognizes that as, an, as a real important issue, a high priority, then the matter of getting organized is to say, let's organize ourselves so that those students face something more than a revolving door. You know, you've heard of the open door concept. Well, I think that we have an open door here, but it's an open revolving door. They're in and back out because they either go on a list to wait for a year, many of them, or maybe it's because we don't have as broad a base as we need. But when I say get organized, that's what I mean. Get ourselves organized so that we are beginning to systematically meet more and more of the needs of this pool of young people who want that education and don't have, are forced to leave the Salt Lake Valley if they really get it. Now, I can't be more specific than that, uh, except to say this. When I first went to the state of Washington, my college, Yakima Valley College, was under the local school board. And we were on the agenda last uh, if you went, when you were under the state board, it may have sound familiar to that because after they'd done all of the public school business, then they gave us 15 minutes or 10 minutes at the end of the meeting to talk about our problems. The way the state organized to meet the needs of students above high school that didn't want to go to the universities was to pass legislation creating a system of two-year colleges now, I just talked to a good friend up there. That happened, oh, 10, 12, 14 years ago, something. And the way they set themselves up was to create a third board. Now they've got problems with it, and some of them feel like they wish they didn't have the third board. So we need to learn from them as we organize to meet those needs. But that's what I had in mind, and I don't have this, any specifics that I could say this and this and this we should do. Well, I don't have any specific plans. Is Judd here? I've talked to Judd a lot of times about it. One of the things that I feel is that if we go just on the basis of statistics, statistics with which I'm familiar with, out of this state, I've not seen statistics here, but I'm sure it's similar, then 80% of the students who come to us as potential students are undecided as to their career goals. 80% of them don't really know what they want to take in college. If 80% of them are undecided and we're going to really help them so that they don't get into your class and then a quarter or two later you and them decide they don't fit, if we get them into the place they need to be, we've got to provide the counseling for them. That's, that's a must. Either the faculty members themselves pick up an added load of trying to do that counseling, or we build a counseling program big enough to meet those counseling needs. Now, we have, I think, four, the equivalent of four full-time counselors here for about 7,000 students. That's a pretty big load if you're a counselor to try to counsel close to 2,000 students in the course of especially when all of them show up at your doorstep within the first week of school. So in order to meet that need, we're going to have to expand our counseling. A lot of faculty members feel comfortable with at least the advising end of counseling and do a pretty good job of working with the occupational counseling. But there are some faculty members who don't really enjoy that side of it. And so we have to, either we have to uh, put pressure on people who don't want to do it, or we find someone else to do it, like in a counseling center. I think, personally, that we do need some kind of an expansion of our counseling center if, in fact, the counseling center is really going to be responsive to the needs of the faculty as the faculty identify them in relation to that kind of counseling. Now, then you get to the question of, if if the legislature gives you enough money for five new positions do you, and, you, and you need 25 faculty members and five counselors, do you put all five of those into teaching 
or do you put one into counseling, or how do you split it up? And so that's the big, that's the big issue is how do we spend the, the limited funds we have? And my guess is that instructional positions have won far more often than the counseling center has in the past, and I don't know how that would come in the future. But I, I feel very strongly the need for a good, solid counseling program at the college and would support it. When I say I would support it, I'm making no commitment between that and the faculty position <laughs> somewhere down the road. But, but it is important. It's tremendously important. I think in a school like this, counseling is more important than any other kind of, of, a, of a college or university they can go to. By the time they go up to the U, they are pretty well decided what they want. They'll change their majors a few times, but if, if four out of every five student coming here just says, I want something beyond high school, help me, then we've got to gear up to help them. Uh, I think it would be possible to get voluntary help, but again, my experience, especially with student tutoring, uh, I've seen student tutoring programs that, that help a whole lot, but still, they can deal only with the more elementary kinds of counseling because if, if they're voluntary, they won't get into the program well enough to know it in depth like a regular full-time counselor or full-time faculty member would. And that's, I think, the, the major drawback to the volunteer assistance. Yes, physical education uh, and lifelong learning. Let me talk first about physical education. I think that tech college students should have as much opportunity for physical education as anyone else. I do not necessarily believe that that include, includes competitive athletics. I think that a good intramural program is an excellent thing because it helps students get that physical exercise that I, over the last few years, have begun to think is very important. But uh, if we ever have competitive athletics at this campus, it'll because it be because I'm pressured into it, not because I led the, the move to get it. Uh, I think we should add some kinds of physical education programs so that they can actually get credit for taking them and then adapt those programs to the unique kinds of classes we have. You know, some of our students will get more exercise just going to class than others, but even a student who's in a welding shop isn't getting the kind of exercise really, even if they're lifting heavy things. They don't get the kind of exercise that they, they need. So I think we should look at having a facility and then adding some kinds of of physical education programs. Now the lifelong learning, I think that that is the education of the future. Lifelong learning means that we just change our attitudes and realize that we never, quote, get out of college or get out of high school with the assumption that that's the end of our education, our formal education. The average age right now, I think, at this college is somewhere around 28 for our students, isn't it? The average age at some colleges, even up at the university, I've heard Dave Gardner mention it several times, the average age up there of their students is past 25, and yet they get so many 18-year-olds right out of high school. That's indicative of people saying, we want education even if we are 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 or older, I believe very strongly in the concept of, of lifelong learning. You know in your classes how many people that show up who are already well past the age that we used to think high school students or beginning college students were. Now how we fit that in and how it competes for dollars with other programs is something that has to be resolved internally. In your comments about uh, the 
state not wanting to fund these programs and these policies. Uh, we're talking about real people here, and it's, uh, to me, very strange that the state thinks they're going to save any money by not putting in colleges, but rather in either public use programs or the rehabilitation of other kind of programs. Uh, I have a 19 year old daughter. And the kind of things that have gone on in that girl's life have been undirected somewhat. But uh, these people, these youth, are wasting a lot of their life. Not having a place to fit, and even it's appalling to me to say, here's a state that has youth, and they're not providing a place for them to go if they want to go there. Well, let me say this much in defense of those who make the decisions on where the dollars go, the state dollars go. Uh, those dollars go pretty much on the basis of who does the best selling job. And we're talking about a pretty subjective kind of a thing. And if we go in there and say, look, education will solve these problems, but it'll take five years or ten years you know, of, of student experience to do that, and then the next person up says, look, We've got so many thousand young people on drugs. We need the money right now because they're hurting right now. I guess if I were a legislator, it would be hard for me to say, well, let's take it and put it into the long-range solution so that we're not spending all our money putting out fires, but we're, we're keeping the fires from getting started. It's a hard decision on their part. And... Uh, I think, I very sincerely think, that the reason we don't get more dollars than we do is that we just haven't learned how to sell ourselves and our needs as well. But we teach a very subjective, I mean, ours is a very subjecting thing. How often have you had people say, you do a lousy job of teaching? How can you prove to me that you're really teaching what you say you are? Well, how do we do it? With difficulty. Because what we do is so subjective, the ability to sell its need is more difficult. Now that's no reason to give up on it. And uh, I have a 20-year-old daughter that is having more problems than any of my other children. She's my youngest. And it's because of the society in which we live and the pressures that she's exposed to. And, uh, okay. That's right. You know, when I graduated from high school, in the state of Idaho, you didn't have to go to high school. All you had to do is graduate from the eighth grade or be 18. And I'll tell you, we had, when I was in the eighth grade, we had some 18-year-olds. But only half of my class went on to high school. And when I finally got that four years of high school, I had, I like to call it a union card, because that's what it is. I had something that would allow me to get jobs easier then a bachelor's degree will let you get a job today. That's how much our society has changed over that very short 35 years. And so what you say is very true. And, and many people don't learn that until they've gotten out of high school and gone somewhere else and tried this old world, and then they find out that they need this something beyond high school. And then they come back to us and say, what have you got? Many of them still aren't decided. But we have to meet that, and, and we have to sell the need for that. And I still say we're not selling the need strong enough to get the more bucks. How do you feel about a testing center on campus, either as a pre-screening or part of the registration process, and also as part of our ongoing testing program within program? Well, my feelings are based on experience there. I think that if we automatically required every student coming to the college to take some kind of a screening test, we could lose 20% of those who are coming here. And so I say, let's don't just require it absolutely. But then I think the solution is that for each department to take a look at their program and see what kind of screening they need so they don't get students in there that don't fit, and then list, establish it on a policy basis, perhaps, that if you go into this class, you've got to take this screening test. And we may end up 
that most of our students will go through some kind of a screening process and that'll probably be about the same test anyway. But if, if we just say you've got to take a screening test to get into college, they won't come. If they get here and we say, now you've got to take this screening test to see how well you fit in this particular area, they'll take the test. It's a matter of attitude. And that's been my experience. And so I would encourage screening tests by department or division as much as is needed to get the students pointed the right direction. But I would resist aggressively a flat requirement that every student coming here take one of those kinds of tests. As part of that, do you think we need a test examiner? We don't have one now, as I understand, any kind of test examiner. Yes. I think that it's a whole lot easier if everyone on campus knows that if a student needs a test, that's where they go, and that's where they take it. So if we don't have one, I think we need to put that on the list <laughs> with all those other things and work towards getting it. We can, by law, establish a, a test as a way of screening down to the students we finally accept. And we can, with Regents' permission, limit our classes no matter how many students are applying for them. Now, when I was in the state of Washington, we always had five times as many people sign up for the nursing classes as we had space. And so we developed we tried a lot of things. The only thing the law would not allow us to do was to do it on a lottery basis. We tried it, and that's what the court said. We, being several schools, said the students are so nearly qualified, similarly qualified. For instance, in the nursing program back there seven or eight years ago, the typical student, the range, we had 60 openings every year. We had 500 students apply some years, and the grade point variation in those 500 students may be all the way from a 3.6 to a 3.9. The only problem we have is that we have to do it in such a way that we can very clearly show that we are not discriminating within the, the, the areas uh, where there is concern for discrimination. As long as we do that, then we can set up a screening device as a means of narrowing down to the number that we can provide, that we have space for. Now, I agree with both of those. I know that this year there was a great deal of concern about doing some things to, to better streamline the process of registration. And I do know that I heard some people say that there were some improvements. If there are still hang-ups, we need to look at it and work at it to improve it again. And the second point you make, I think it's absolutely necessary that we work out a process so that the relationship between faculty, regular instructors, and the counseling center is, is a good, positive, coordinated thing, or else the counseling won't be of near the value that it would otherwise be. And so if, if we have problems there, and I'm sure we do because it's always the case to a certain extent, then think, I think both of those are areas where we need to continually work at it. Now, I hate lines. I've hated them ever since I was a, an enlisted man in the Army. And so anything we can do to eliminate lines, I'm all in the favor of. I also think that if students know that they're going to have to wait in a long line out here, some of them may not come back. So we have to consider that. How do you feel about education of employment, for employment, and during employment? Co-op education. You must be in charge of co-op education. <laughs>
Uh, I guess I would respond in this way. Uh, there are undoubtedly some kinds of programs that don't lend themselves to co-op education, but my experience says that there are far fewer than many faculty members feel. There are some students that absolutely do not want to do co-op education, and I don't think we should try to force them into it. But again, my experience is that most students who've had an opportunity to get involved in co-op education like it and feel like that it's maybe one of the best things that happened to let them really find out whether the field they're in is, the, is where they want to be. It does another thing, and that is it exposes them to the, to the business area that they're interested in, and many, many students end up already having a job before they finish school just through their co-op education experience. So I'm favorably, uh, I, I certainly support co-op education as one of the alternatives for a student, and I would encourage it to the extent that, uh, that it fits into the program. I agree. Uh, I think that if we're doing our job, we should soon become recognized as the most responsive college in the county to those kinds of needs. Now, some of those needs are tied directly with our regular programs, and we'll have to work those out internally to meet them and modify a program, a, a full two-year program, maybe, maybe to meet them. But many, many of those needs are the kind that will fit into this new program we have that we call, is it external programs? External programs that uh, Verlaine McPhee is in charge of. If we get a call today about a need and we followed up on it before the day's out or by tomorrow, something like that, and that really puts a pressure on a, uh, an office, but if we can do that and be successful at it, pretty soon those people are going to be supporting this college because we're meeting their needs and they'll support the rest of the program also. But we should be that way. And because of that, this external programs, I think, will continue to grow as fast as it is now. And if you were to sit down with Verlaine, you almost wouldn't believe how fast it is growing right now. At least that was my impression. But we need to meet those needs. We, we have to be ready so that we can pick up and within a day or two, go up to the uh, Capitol building with a class that Verlaine told me about just last week that we're, we're running up there for, for one of the offices. Or to get out to Kennecott and meet a special need. Or I can't remember all of the, it seemed like hundreds of places that Verlaine mentioned that she's in contact with now. So that's another major aspect of the college is to meet those needs, many of which are, are require training programs or, or instructional programs of very short duration. Way back up there in the corner. Yes. In responding to 
library in the state at the present time that has all the books for all the contractors to take <laughs> We have con people who want to take the examinations from all over the state wanting to use our library. We are the only library that has responded to that need. Now, are you the li librarian? I think so. <laughs> The light's shining just behind you, so I can't, can't see you. <laughs> well, let me talk just a minute about library. You know, uh, I've bumped into people in tech colleges who say tech colleges don't need libraries. But you've pointed out something that's very important. We don't need the library like the university has. We don't need one as extensive and we don't need many of the kinds of things that are in there. But somewhere in the state they need a library that has all of these examinations, these tests like you're mentioning. We need a library that meets all of the kinds of needs, not just for our students but for the people we serve in business and industry in the areas that we have. And so I think we need to have a library that if we're going to, for instance, if we're going to be, move into an area, we need to make sure that it is complete in that area. So that when someone comes out here, they find out that we don't, they don't find out that we have only half of what they need. And so the library is important. It's not important just because the Northwest Association says you need more books. It's important because of the needs of our, of our students and of the people of the business and industry that, that our students will go to. Now there was another hand way up there. Yes, you. Well, that's not an accreditation problem. That's, uh, that's the university. The university chooses to accept or not accept those. Now there are some limits to that. If the classes are really applied science classes, then the university is not geared up to accept those, and it's unusual, I'm sure, for them to accept any of them because they are and continue to profess to be not a vocational school. But all of the classes, just like Dave Gardner made a point, and I'm going to remind him of this, in the Regents meeting the other day, he said, when we were talking about, well, one of the Regents made a strong pitch that we put more money into vocational education at the college level. And Dave was immediately up there to discuss the matter with him or make his point. And he said this, he said, it looks to me like English taught at the university is as vocational as English taught at the tech college, or math taught at the university is as, as vocational as math taught here. Now we need to turn that around and say, therefore, any math or English class and a number of others that we teach down here should be transferable up there. But we may finally need legislation to make it happen. <coughs> Excuse me. In the state of Washington, we never finally managed to get our classes from the two-year schools transferable to the two universities and the other state colleges until they passed legislation saying that it would happen. Before that, the, the faculty members from the individual departments would insist that we mail them a, a copy of the syllabus for a class and sometimes they'd rewrite it and say, either you teach it this way or you can't, it's not transferable. We need to work on that because we have a lot of classes here. I would guess that in the business area is perhaps the place where we have the highest percent of classes that, are, that we consider vocational in nature that should be transferable. Now, a lot of you may want to disagree with it. Gary, you want to disagree with that? No, sir. No, no. <laughs>
And we have a lot of egg on our plate. Uh, can I ask the person right in front of you to answer that question? Well, I didn't understand the first half of it, but I heard the second half. <laughs> okay, we, we have, as of Tuesday, Wednesday, sometime, <laughs> but we now have a full-time director of placement for the technical college. We were criticized by the people who came here in the voc for the vocational accreditation last spring because of, of what we were doing for placement. And we've done some internal shifting and, and have a full-time director of placement. Now, this is temporary because before we fill the position officially... <laughs> now, I see I better clarify something. <laughs> the present status is temporary. The position is permanent except for this. According to our affirmative action policy, once we get the position identified clearly and a, and a job description in place, according to our affirmative action policy, we will have to open the position for general acceptance of, of applications. But that does not in any way preclude the person who is in the position and in fact helping write the job description being one of the candidates, and I'm sure that that would give them at least some assistance before the search committee in being viewed as the final, fi the final director of placement. But there is that kind of thing that we have to go through. We are building a placement, a director of placement position. And is it Gene? If I can write it, I've got it. What? <laughs> yeah, if you can write it, you've got it. I can say that. <laughs> I can say that because I won't be on the screening committee. <laughs> yes, you. Well, now, I guess my question is, isn't it already that way? No. Oh. <laughs> well, then that's something we need to, to discuss, I can see. Because I think that the services that fit together should be placed together. They should be coordinated to the advantage of the student. And if we don't have that, then I think we need to look at it and find out why. Uh, and if, if the reasons aren't good reasons, then change it. Now, yes, right here. You mentioned, or we've been discussing, going out in the industry and helping them. But at the present time, we have the problem. We have a lot of industry that have come to us with electronics and want help. We have neither the equipment, some of the that we need. And we're now overloaded with students, so we haven't the instructors. <coughs> Well, I guess I don't have a quick answer. I'm looking around. Where's Max? <laughs> <laughs> because let me, let me elaborate just a this much on that. I think that if we don't get ourselves in a position where we can be of at least some assistance to those people when they come and ask us for help, that they are going to go to Arizona or, or somewhere else. Now, there are several ways of doing that, some of them within the program. One that's very, very common in four-year colleges, I've discovered, and universities, is that uh, we not only allow but encourage up to a point faculty members to become, quote, consultants in the, on their own time uh, to handle some of those. Now, I don't know if that would work here. 
I don't know why it wouldn't, but I do think we need to look very closely at what, what we can do with, uh, within our limitations so that we do meet the needs of business and industry. And the reason the idea of faculty members being consultants outside of their regular job, as long as you know, that doesn't, the job doesn't become the, the part-time part of it, is that uh, that's an incentive, in my opinion, the consulting I've done, the consulting was kind of the gravy on top for me and after I got out and got familiar, got myself up to speed and acquainted with what the current status of the art was, that helped me more than anything else to go back and be a good instructor or a good supervisor or whatever various jobs I've held. And so that particular part of it may be as much value to the individual for self-satisfaction as anything else that could happen. So to the extent, to a certain extent, I think that sort of thing should be encouraged. Thanks. Uh, President, uh, we just had an inquiry in within the last week from a large uh, company that is willing to let us come and use their facility two or three nights a week, and he's willing to provide instructors to update our family on equipment and those kinds of things that they need, and we can actually use theirs. So I've had another inquiry come in along those That may be a way we begin to have to look is working with industry and saying, hey, if you need it, what kind of arrangements can we work out? Because our facilities right now are limited in equipment. What equipment could you get us? And what kind of facilities could you help us with? And it's amazing some of them are very, very willing to talk about that. You know, I spoke to a group uh, a week or two ago here on campus relative to vocational advisory committees, especially craft committees, and uh, I have a pretty good feel for the general attitude towards those, but if they're, if they're created properly and handled properly, not only are they of extreme value to us in knowing the current state of the art so we're not teaching to obsolescence, which is a concern, it's always a concern as fast as technology is changing, but when we establish as close a working relationship with the members of those craft committees as we should, we're then in a position where you may not even believe the amount of assistance in the way of sharing facilities and equipment or gifts, outright gifts of equipment that will be a direct result of that through those people's companies in those areas. And we should take advantage of it. I believe very sincerely that if we don't get into the business of getting private money into this college in the next few years, we're going to be stopped. I think that, that the pr private money is the thing that will be the difference between success and failure. That It's a small edge sometimes, but I think we have to get into the business of getting out and looking for private dollars and we have a built-in access to so many businesses and industries and corporations, we ought to utilize it. I mentioned this small college in the state that I think this year got up to a million dollars. The university last year collected $16 million, as I understand, through their development office. That's a pretty valuable extension or asset, I'd say, at the college. So we need to do that because state dollars are not increasing. The pinch on available sources through appropriations is going to be there for this state and other states for a long, long time. And if we want to help ourselves in addition to, to doing all we can to get those dollars, we've also got to reach out and start looking for other sources of dollars to, to assist us, I think. Now, I thought I saw a hand, I guess not, up there.
we'll take the phones out. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> you touch on a very important thing. Uh, if we don't have the assistance, clerical assistance and other kinds of assistance for the faculty member, then the faculty member, to some extent, becomes a clerk. And I agree that the, to the extent, now you never get away from that entirely, or at least in my experience it's not happened, but some of those things can be improved. And uh, that's a part of what I call the, the matter of, I said organization, I'd like to change that to say I'm going to be looking at organization and process. Because if you don't get the processes worked out, the organization is, structure is no good to you anyway. And if that's a, if that's a bottleneck of, uh, there, then it needs to be looked at to see what can be done to ease it and then, and then see if we can afford to do what has to be done. And I think it's as simple as, as that. But let me say this. You've mentioned the last year or two. I'm very carefully not digging too deeply into what has transpired in the last two or three years because my philosophy is I came on August 1 and I'm going from August 1. So I'll reach back into what's happened the last two or three years or 20 years only to the extent necessary to get a clear enough picture that I can do what has to be done from here on. But if there are problems that have developed that are real pinch problems, then I do want to, to address to them. It's always the problems tie right back to the availability of money, either for supplies or equipment or uh, assistance. Um, what are your feelings? I feel very strongly that we should, uh, I understand we have an affirmative action policy. Jim got me a copy of it some time ago and I haven't read it yet. I think that uh, I personally am committed to the concept of affirmative action. I think that even if I weren't, laws being what they were, I would conform to affirmative action. Now I know, in my experience, I've seen people who wanted to use affirmative action to gain some things far beyond what the law was intended to gain, and I wouldn't be too much in favor of that, but the kind of, I think that we have an obligation as an institution to conform to to all of the of the the concepts of affirmative action and see that we adhere to them and I've had several people indicate to me that they felt such was not the case in some instances that's one of the places where I'd say I don't want to go back and try to to change something that's so far back that it can't be changed uh, but f starting from here, the reason I asked Jim Snurl if he would get me a copy of the affirmative action policy is that I want to know what it says and either be prepared to live with within that policy or if I feel that it isn't the, the appropriate policy, suggest that we review it to see how we can make it more nearly fit this institution. And I, I say that with no preconceived notions that it doesn't. I assume that that it probably does.